So this is an interview with Gemma Green, and it's about some of the technology that can help us create net zero corridors and how we can integrate urban development and trackless trams. So Gemma, um, you and I have worked together on a PhD and other projects that are related to how you integrate solar energy into future cities. And you have demonstrated how to share solar and to enable it to be part of urban developments and urban grids. So can you tell us a bit about that story? Thanks, Peter. I think that you know power systems have been centralised for about a century. You know, big power stations, transmission lines, distribution lines, bringing electricity to people's homes and businesses. And everyone in Australia is very familiar with like you know rooftop solar. You know, 25% plus households have it, but we haven't really conceived what that means in terms of like the organisation of energy on our grids in a new way. And we're still doing a lot of planning, centralised planning for large scale infrastructure and. Um, in Australia, like the integrated system plan, um, you know, has a lot of capital expenditure around, you know, transmission and interconnectors, and some of them are really important. But it is possible to perhaps um, have more efficient use of transmission lines by, like, within communities, building enough solar uh, in the right places and storage, and co-locating renewable energy generation near to the consumption and reducing the need for the transportation piece and um, to drive you know net zero um, communities and, and cities and what it does also is it reduces line losses because if you move electricity long distances you can lose you know you, you could lose 30 to 40 percent of the electricity from the transportation process uh, and then you've also got the costs of that that are baked into everyone's electricity bills. Mm. So a leaner and more efficient system can also be a, a lower carbon system as well. Uh, but that involves kind of like people understanding what that means. So you know, there's you know, big infrastructure funds like superannuation funds tend to invest in big um, like energy infrastructure projects and they're fairly powerful you know, in influencing governments yeah. about that's, that's the way it should be. Why they've always done it, yeah. Correct. Mm. Yeah, and a lot of those infrastructure assets in the superannuation funds are ex-government assets that were privatised. Mm. Um, and so there's a kind of strong link between the kind of establishment of those um, kinds of assets as like, we must have them and we, they must look like this. And there isn't really a kind of counterbalance to that conversation. Like the Property Council and, um, you know, the Smart Energy Council, I think, could benefit from creating a bigger discourse around what do we mean by distributive energy markets and actually distinguishing that. Mm -hmm. And I think what it means is there's an opportunity for building to become citizen power stations, as you know, mm. I, I've put in my PhD. And what I think that means is them getting an understanding of how to design their developments in such a way that's going to um, not just, oh, just stick in solar, but, oh, if we put batteries in, how do we create income streams that, mm. um, you know, offset strata bills and, okay. and make it more economically attractive? Uh, these things happening in Perth um, are really pushing the system towards being a distributed model faster than the centralised utilities uh, really expected or wanted. Um, and around the world, they're, they're a little bit surprised to see that the Wild West is actually coming up with something quite interesting. Sort of because we have to do it. We're getting a megawatt a week being put into the system from rooftop solar. Because in Perth, we just like to buy rooftop solar and put it on and it's worked. So. That was trundling along quite nicely in the background. And then along came WGV, which was a project where you had to share the solar because you've got a shared roof. It's medium density development. So tell us how you went about helping to solve that problem of how you share solar. Well, I mean, that had been the big challenge, the kind of principal agent problem or split incentive problem, which is where 
you know, if I buy an apartment and it's got a solar system on it, how do I make sure I get my fair share and other people don't get more than their fair share? And it's a bit like, you know, going to a restaurant, you know, with lots of friends and some people have an entree and others have a main course and some have two bottles of wine and there's that awkward moment when the bill comes out and you either go, oh, let's split the bill or someone gets out a calculator and very tediously calculates all those elements. And it's not really a dinner party you want to go to all that often and probably in either respect because mm. um, you either pay too much or you've got that uncomfortable yeah, moment. I usually pay the bill. Yeah, <laughs> you're very generous, Peter. <laughs> Um, but in terms of um, this, like co this concept inside of an apartment building, you want something that is fair. And mm -hmm. we came up with this idea of an allocation model, where everyone is allocated a portion of the output of the solar and battery system. And if they don't consume that allocation, they can trade it with their neighbours and offset their electricity bill. And it creates a really egalitarian system that's very transparent. And uh, it means that people are encouraged to in invest in these assets because they the benefits associated with their investment are, are fairly allocated to them. So, and that worked in WGV? Yeah, so PowerLedger, um, you know, set up in 2016 and uh, our first project was actually in Bustleton uh, for the National Lifestyle Villages demonstrating how peer-to-peer -peer trading would work across grids. Um, but then we've also put that in microgrids in WGV. So we've got the Gen Y housing development, which has got a solar and battery system, Evermore and uh, Shack. Um, all of them are in the WGV development, mm -hmm. three different apartment buildings, and they've got slightly different models. And um, we develop software, which does exactly what I just described to you there. And uh, it's still you know, working and um, making sure that everyone is paying what they should and not paying more than they should and receiving income for any energy they don't mm. consume. So it's encouraging them to be more energy efficient. And broadly, I think what that whole precinct shows is how local energy autonomy can be created and um, done in a way that really is very empowering for people. Yeah, and also help the grid as, as it transitions. Absolutely. So um, that worked and blockchain was the key part of that. Um, which you haven't explained, but you don't need to, but... Well, I can, I can explain it as a tracking system. You know, if you're told that you're consuming a certain amount of energy and you're told that it's being renewable, you want to be able to trust that. Mm. And what the blockchain does is provides a really clear record that anyone can check and know that what they think is happening is happening. Because the yeah. last thing you want to do is think you're buying renewables only to find that you know, you're buying something else. Mm. Um, and so the blockchain really just provides a really immutable record that you can rely upon. And that's really important for people to buy into renewable energy because um, you can't actually see the electrons, but you yeah. want to know that yeah. what you think is happening is actually happening. Okay. So it's a very reliable ledger and uh, it's very it's a tool for the managers of that system yeah yeah okay now the that idea worked um, and then the next idea was to see how it could work across a community that has lots of PVs but no community batteries and how they could share solar and storage facilities called renew Nexus how did that work well, uh, as you say, Renew Nexus involved um, cross-grid trading of solar um, uh, to, to show how local energy markets could work. But also there's a large grid-scale battery uh, within the East Village in Fremantle as a part of that. And that's actually going to do cross-grid trading to help uh, balance the grid as well, to take set surplus solar during the day from the grid and store it and help um, with grid stabilisation activities. So the first part, the solar peer-to-peer trading piece that had two phases to it. So we signed up customers to do um, peer to peer trading in the first instance and the insights we gained from that, we realised that we needed more consumers that don't have solar to get the trading activity happening. Mm. So we did a phase two, which had a more equal balance of um, what was needed to create the viable trading market. Mm. Um, and we published a report about that, which you obviously co-authored. Yeah. And, and was... I think what it shows though is how a price signal can encourage local consumption of solar so that it doesn't get exported to the grid and uh, as a result of that cause problems on the grid. Because when the solar gets exported, that's when you get this phenomenon called the duck curve, which is effectively congestion on the grid um, and ultimately results in, um, you know, if it's not dealt with, then the actual grid infrastructure um, wears out faster. So you have to 
replace it sooner and that adds more cost which everyone pays for. Mm. So it's better for the consumer but it's also better for the grid to have that system mm. and I can see how that needs to spread across the whole city and that's what I want to talk to you about and obviously you're doing a lot more work than those few projects because we're sitting in your office and there's 35 people here now so what are they all doing? Well we have um, about 20 uh, clients in 10 countries. Whoa. Okay. So um, in India, we're working with Tata Power doing peer-to-peer -peer trading in Delhi. Um, India made big targets around renewable energy and they hit the large-scale targets, but the, the small-scale renewable targets, they're lagging behind. And so they're looking at how can they encourage the growth of renewables uh, using peer-to-peer -peer trading without the need for government subsidy. Okay. And how can they encourage the growth of renewables um, in parts of the grid that can handle it, but not in parts of the grid that can't. So rather than having a centralised blunt price signal that encourages you know, the proliferation of renewables anywhere and at any time, not necessarily when and where it's needed, about how to get the price signals right to encourage growth of renewables in parts of the grid where it can handle that, but not beyond. Okay. So, um, so um, India's one, but yeah. we're in France and we've got a project there with the fifth largest retailer called Equator, okay. um, called Choose Your Mix. So the customers are uh, using our platform will soon be able to specify not just a renewable tariff but I want solar from my favourite solar farm down the road and this wind farm and we measure on the blockchain how much energy that solar farm or wind farm has produced within a 30 minute time period, how much energy that consumer has consumed in that time period and we create a record on the blockchain so the output of those assets is not over allocated to customers and uh, they think they're buying energy from that source but it, they're not actually. So that's another way of using the blockchain and over the East Coast in Australia we're doing a partnership with Carlton United Breweries who have um, are powering their VB brewery in part from households with rooftop solar and um, selling it peer to peer to the brewery and being paid in cartons of beer delivered to their house. So is that what's called a virtual power plant? Uh, we call it Solar Swap, or okay. VB have called, named it the VB Solar Exchange. Okay. Um, but it's effectively residential customers selling to CNI customers. Yeah. Um, okay. So a virtual power plant would probably be more including a battery in yeah, the concept. Okay. Yeah. And I, I can't see how we can do citywide stuff unless we have lots of community batteries in there, but not necessarily in every house or every business. Well, it'll probably be both, Peter. I think yeah. that um, that I think both have a role. We're grid yeah. batteries, community batteries, household batteries, and there'll also be batteries in like shopping centres and you know big commercial and industrial centres. Mm. Mm. And electric vehicles fit into this down the track, um, and that introduces for me the main topic, which is our trackless trams are electric. They have batteries on the roof. They sometimes need recharging, but they're going to be setting up station precincts that are likely to have lots of electromobility feeding into them, as in small electric shuttle buses, uh, electric bikes, electric skateboards, um, uh, and electric vehicles. Uh, essentially, um, a recharge hub as a station and these stations will then be surrounded by houses covered in PVs because that's what everyone will now be doing and all of that needs to be managed mm. by a microgrid. So let's imagine we've got a trackless tram going down a corridor setting up each of these little station precincts as net zero station precinct residential developments. And we want to see how that can work. How does each of them need to be managed separately with their own little group managing it? Uh, do they get managed by the whole corridor, or the whole city, the whole grid, or what? what? What's your first reaction to that? Well, you know, you know, just ask me to plan a transportation energy system. Um, thanks for that, Peter. Yeah, easy. <laughs> well, you solve a lot of problems. Uh, well, I mean, when you were speaking, I actually thought that there could be a role for hydrogen in that story as well, 
um, potentially, because if you can turn hydrogen, if you can turn renewable energy into green hydrogen, and then you can use that hydrogen in a fuel cell to power trams or other forms of transport. So it could be batteries uh, um, as well. So surplus solar being stored in a battery, um, but both of those sort of storage mechanisms yeah. could be used to power that. But you'd need um, like a price basically that could be paid for for that energy. And so I think that the ability for um, for the the precincts to understand what would be the willingness to pay by the trackless tram um, for energy would really inform the business case around them putting a battery in big enough to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And that if they could know that that you know would be on an ongoing basis, that would really underpin the the kind of return on investment needed yeah. to kind of um, you know justify it. Yeah, we we see it as being part of a main grid, really. So it's just it would tie into that, uh, and but the it's the interaction with all those other smaller micro mobility that needs recharging. Recharging, yeah. So there's a um, piece of legislation in Europe called the Clean Energy Package, um, and one part of that is called Energy Communities, and it's really centred around community groups forming their own kind of. Re, re, electricity retailer. Mm. So, for example, a school could set up and become a retailer, and all the mums and dads could um, sell energy to the retailer and buy, and it can become like a kind of virtual grid inside the grid. Um, like, like you called it a micro grid. I mean, mm. it, it's really cross grid trading, but you know, through that kind of linked by the community. And I think what you're talking about there is a similar, feels like a similar concept mm. where you've got these different um, new, new players in the market. That are in the energy market that want to participate, not just as a buyer, but also to, to sell services. Mm. Um, so I think that the the two-sided market rule changes in Australia are going to support that kind of initiative and could really um, like underpin the sort of creation mm. of that kind of world that you're just describing. Well, it is a world that's going to be happening quite quickly in Perth because First of all, we have to be able to adapt to the fact that this rolling momentum behind the uh, solar system that mm. is coming and is actually going to disrupt the grid or they use it uh, in a positive way yeah. to create benefit. And, uh, and the fact is they've also, um, the state government's now accepted that there will be new corridors with these new electric trams of some kind and we're suggesting these trackless trams because they are the latest technology and they, they will fit but um, how to get that land development to fit into that story so that you get the net zero and the benefits to the grid and the benefits of the transport system at the same time is what we're struggling with and there is going to be lots of demonstrations needed um, but I can imagine that once you've set that up and it's working and all the people who live and work in those little station precincts with their microgrid, um, it could spread out into the suburb because we're getting houses out there with solar on the roof and they're wanting to be linked in to that um, I think you're that right. New centre. Mm, that and you can modularise it. You can modularise, yeah, yeah. It'll go out. So eventually it takes over the whole city and you have your net zero city. I, I like the sound of this, Peter. And I think that what you've just described there could be a great use case for the duck curve. Like all that surplus electricity can be harnessed and mobilised in a way that's actually supportive of the grid. So, you know, timing the charging around when the sun's shining and um, you know to minimize the need for storage which could be more costly but um, I think that that could really harness the you know the full yeah. potential of the sun to drive you know sustainable cities yeah and and motor vehicles have a lot of going to have a lot of battery storage uh, I was given the figure that a, a hundred thousand electric cars would be the equivalent of 500 megawatts of storage that's a lot, that and that's lot. the kind of momentum stuff that the grid is looking to get from all of these. Uh, you know, they procure it to, to back up the, uh, the the system. Well, it's the backup is there. It's going to be in the city, 
And when you think of the thousands of buses we've got, that'll all become electric. I think that's a no-brainer. And it's I mean that very clearly got good storage. Totally. Well. Yeah. I think that I mean all those kind of commercial and industrial mm. um, fleets to I mean yeah. moving those over would, would should be really a priority I would think yeah. in terms of very, very cleaning much. up the air in our cities and where yeah. are you where are you thinking the um, trackless tram project would go would start like where would you like the well it's clearly going to start in Stirling because they've been given money from the federal government to actually do a business case and to start it there mm -hmm. and that's likely to be happening very quickly uh, we have been working with the councils along there that would take it through the city of Vincent, through the city of Perth, out through the city of Victoria Park, through Curtin and out to the city of Canning. That's one. The other route is Fremantle out to Melville, uh, where along South Street, the, those councils have got together and worked on it. But the reality is lots of councils have lots of projects where they can now see that an east-west connection that enables the strong north-south movement of mm -hmm. the metro mm -hmm. system, Metronet, um, can be facilitated. Oh. And in that process, people will want to live and work on that. That will drive the opportunity to build these station uh -huh. precincts and you start to get urban development happening where it can be contributing to the net zero transition. Story. So how do you see Metronet and the trackless tram store, which store uh, projects interacting with each other? Well, at stations you need to be able to bring people to those stations without them having massive car traffic doing it or just buses. But the buses at the moment are going along these main roads. If we could increase that, the quality of that ride, the, the rapidity of it, uh, they'd get more people out of cars and more people would then get to the Metronet. So it's going to be a benefit to Metronet, it's going to be a benefit to the grid. And when you put those two things together, you should be able to show that a net zero corridor, creating a net zero city, has overall benefits far superior to any costs. Mm. Wow, I mean it sounds very exciting and, it's, it, and uh, is, is that the, happening anywhere else in the world? Or is no, per you see, that's oh. the thing, we are way ahead of the of the ball game on this, not because of great strategies and commitments and so on, but because ordinary human households in Perth chose solar and uh -huh. rapidly did it. We did it actually at a time when we were in booming, the, the last mineral boom, and put lots of them up and that started a process that's continued. We, we're now getting a megawatt a week, as I said. So this is an amazing story that's happening and you can't stop it. And the minister fortunately has, has said, we are not curtailing this growth. We're going to accommodate it and build around it. And uh, so you've got some very clever people in government now organising how to make that happen. But we need community, really, organisations like Power Ledger, developers who are innovative, and there are quite a few of them saying, we want a net zero development. I'm saying, well, I think we can show you how to do it. We need you to be able to show us how. I can see that blockchain and, and the kind of software that you have will be critical to making those station precincts and the area around them work as a microgrid that is essentially helping the grid I hope you can see that. Yeah, I mean, I think we should talk to the property council and some of the developers involved in that, and really, like, engage with them around what that might look like, and get and yeah, talk more details to take it from concept into specific. Yeah, well, we've got some good Italians or already doing that, so um, <laughs> I'm sure you'd be very happy about that. And um, yeah, we need to to see how it fits, but that that kind of project, you can see how. This will provide for us a, a future direction that can be given to any other city in Australia uh, or in the world. It's a blueprint for how to do it. Now we want to set that out and, 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 and have some demonstrations. We've shown it in WGV and East Village. Mm -hmm. Now we need to whole, get a whole station precinct 
development. And we've got hundreds of students now beginning to work on that idea. Yeah, I mean, what I noticed is that in at the East Village, um, we've got a, a project with OP Properties, which where they're taking the rooftop solar um, to basically offset the strata levies, and they have mm. half the strata costs associated with that, and it's sold really well, so now they're going to replicate it. And you can see with these demonstration projects, you know, the light bulb moment comes on and they go, oh, this is actually enhancing the mm. product that I'm... Yeah. We're not having to wave a flag and say, oh, we've got extra sustainability stuff that we put on, but, you know, it's not too expensive, but, you know, all of that stuff, we've been through that. We can now show it halves the cost of the strata title uh, contribution. Yeah, it's really significant. Oh, that is that is significant. Yeah. Well, that's what we're looking for, to see how that can drive this process. So people would be in Stirling, like if it's the first place, mm. would be able to live in a precinct and go, this is like a zero emissions precinct. It's super livable. It's, I've got great transport links into the city. And that is a blueprint for how other um, like urban regeneration projects or urban infill projects could, could happen. Very good. Well, that's the light bulb moment that we need to share with the world. And uh, thank you for uh, agreeing that it's Thanks. a good one. <laughs> well, I've just heard about it today, but I'm, I'm very excited, Peter, and I think I think we should we should prioritise going to speak to them next week and like okay. see what we can make happen. Let's do it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right.